Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. This week I decided to cover a case briefly mentioned in another case I covered. You may remember the Walker family video from about a year ago. If not, I'll link it for reference. But I had a viewer named Rick ask me to look further into this case, since at one point it was believed the Walker case and the case of the Sarasota mummy murder were connected. So I ask you all to please join me as we remember Chandler Steffens. August 8, 1959, Betty Steffens, a young, pretty woman, arrived at 934 Yale Avenue in Sarasota, Florida. The house belonged to her in-laws and was the current dwelling of her husband, Chandler. Usually the property was leased to renters, but at the time was vacant. Chandler promised to call Betty that morning since the couple had plans, but he failed to do so. She arrived shortly before noon, ready to pull her husband from his slumber, but instead discovered a horrific scene. Chandler's body was on the floor next to the bed, his wrists were bound to his neck by an electric cord cut from a nearby fan. His legs were restrained by ropes. He appeared to be brutally beaten and stabbed several times. A mask made from adhesive tape was wrapped around his head where two small holes were made for breathing and his throat was slashed from ear to ear. Betty retreated from the bedroom out into the street where she cried out for help, stating, It's Shan. Someone's hurt Shan. Police arrived at the home shortly after, and the investigation was underway. Chandler was discovered in a neat and orderly room. He was wearing just his boxer shorts. His clothing from the previous night were folded on a nearby chair. Betty explained Chandler always slept in his boxers, so it was believed Chandler was already asleep when the suspect entered the residence. She confirmed her husband was a heavy sleeper. He was struck in his right temple a blow sufficient enough to stun him but not render him unconscious, giving his attacker time to restrain him. Police believe Chandler might have lurched at the attacker or rolled off the bed based on the small amount of blood found on the bed. They determined he endured at least 40 minutes, if not more, of torture and was alive through the whole ordeal. They discovered on the table next to the bed bloody imprints where the knife was picked up and set back down several times as if the killer stopped to admire their work. All in all, Chandler's murder wasn't about the final result, but the process it took to get there. Detectives felt the murderer took their time based on the number of wounds and bruises, but mostly from the mask made. Based on the scene, it was believed Chandler's death was well thought out and executed by someone with skill and precision. The home showed no signs of forced entry, but a side door was found unlocked. According to his wife, Chandler often slept with windows open to allow airflow during the summer. The neighborhood where the attack happened was in a nice area. Most houses at the time were empty since the wealthier Sarasota residents spent summer vacation up north. Those home, however, did not hear any disturbances or see anyone in the neighborhood between 10 p.m. when he left Betty at her parents' home and 1 a.m. his alleged time of death. Only a few people knew Chandler was staying in the home at the time. He was only in Sarasota for two days and spent brief periods at the house. The clues were few, but it was determined the killer brought their own supplies after kitchen utensils from the home were ruled out. Prior to leaving the home, the killer washed up in the bathroom and took a hand towel with them. According to the housekeeper, the towel was there five days before and was part of a set. Betty stated Chandler had about $175 in his wallet at the time, which he was paid monthly from a trust fund. The money was missing, but police did not believe the motive to be robbery. They felt it was an afterthought since the home was not ransacked. A single cigarette butt from a brand neither Chandler or Betty smoked was found along with various unidentified fingerprints from the bedroom. The autopsy revealed Chandler likely died around 1 a.m. The cause of death was due to blood loss. He had no rope burns on his hands, indicating he did not fight back when the killer taped his face. The motive behind the killing of Chandler Steffens was difficult to establish. In order to gain further insight, they looked into his background for answers. Chandler Steffens was born on February 17, 1937, in New York to parents Nina and Kenneth Steffens. 
He was the grandson of the former chairman of Scripps Howard, a company which owned several newspapers. His father was a retired real estate agent and a former Sarasota banker. In 1950, his parents divorced with his mother eventually moving to New York and his father remarrying his stepmother. Kenneth moved to Mexico later in life and spent minimal time in Sarasota in order to avoid alimony payments to Nina. He attended Sarasota High School, where he was known for being a star right halfback for the football team, until 1954, when he led a revolt of the team. He didn't want to observe the training rules set in place by his coach during a losing streak, so he decided to walk away. His coach couldn't understand, since he felt Chandler's problems were no more than average teenagers. Those who knew Chandler well, including his wife, gave conflicting descriptions. Some friends stated he was outgoing, while others said he was nervous and often hid behind his troubles. Previous educators claimed he was erratic and unstable, while another said he was responsible and from a good family. No one seemed to have a clear idea of who they thought he was. During his final year of high school, Chandler met then Betty Thompson the daughter of a wealthy celery farmer, and the two fell in love. He was set to graduate later that year, so the two eloped in a quick ceremony in Brunswick, Georgia on January 27, 1955. She was 17 while he was 18. The couple moved to Cincinnati, Ohio after high school, so Chandler could study engineering at the University of Ohio. The couple found an apartment and Chandler spent several months studying before deciding to take up a part-time job due to their growing family. Some time after, they welcomed their first child, Michael. He found work at the local Formica laboratory, but after several months, Chandler decided to give up his studies and work full-time at the lab. The neighbors stated the Steffens were well-liked and seemed to really care for each other. They never heard them argue and described Chandler as a wonderful young man full of fun, and good to his wife. Sure, they had their problems as a young couple, doing it all alone, but they adjusted to their situation well. Mostly, they adored their infant son. They talked often about returning to Florida to be closer to family, since Chandler wanted to return to school. So after two years of living in Cincinnati, the Steffens moved back to Florida, this time to Gainesville, where Chandler enrolled in the University of Florida. In Florida, they received financial help from their parents. The couple welcomed their second child shortly after arriving, this time a daughter they named Patrice. According to Betty, however, by spring semester, the young couple's relationship took a turn. Chandler, who was back in college, seemed to want to spend less and less time with his wife. She claimed the last six months of their marriage was spent with Chandler staying out late and not telling his wife where he was, while she felt more like a housekeeper rather than his wife. He shared little to no affection towards her, and she felt there was nothing she could do to please him. He always found fault with her. Betty stated he often cursed and criticized her in their private life and in the company of mutual friends. Before they decided to separate, Chandler told Betty their marriage was a mistake and they were too young. He didn't want to be tied down to her. During one incident while she was pregnant with their first child, Chandler flew into a tantrum while at a picnic with friends. Betty felt ill and wanted to go home, but he wasn't having it. He claimed she was just trying to take him away from the event. She always felt a lot of their problems stemmed from Chandler's tendency to overstudy, rather than spend his free time with family. Eventually, after months of feeling this way, the two decided to call it quits by June of 1959. Chandler stayed in Gainesville to attend summer school, while Betty and their two children returned to her parents' home in Sarasota. Back in Sarasota, Betty admitted to detectives she filed for divorce on July 14th because his actions made her married duties unbearable and unsafe. The Steffens felt their marriage was doomed until Chandler decided to return back to Sarasota after his summer courses ended on August 5th. Upon his arrival, Betty stated her and Chandler decided to give their marriage another go. His sole purpose of returning was to repair his relationship. His attorney filed a motion to dismiss the divorce proceedings. Despite their conflicts, they wanted to start over. They wanted to stay together for their children. Rather than move into his in-law's home with his family, he decided the best course of action would be to shelter at the unoccupied home owned by his stepmother. Betty stated the day before his body was found, she and Chandler spent some time at his stepmother's home before going out shopping. 
They had dinner with Betty's parents, then went out to Smack's, a local hangout where they met with friends. Afterwards, he took Betty home around 10 p.m., then presumably headed back to his stepmother's house for the night. The couple had plans to leave the following day for Gainesville to find a new apartment. Betty was questioned and given a lie detector test, and although she cleared up a lot of questions, detectives were no closer to understanding who could be responsible. Family and those closest to Chandler were slowly being eliminated as suspects. His uncle mentioned Chandler had a $15,000 life insurance policy, but it wasn't clear if the policy was carried by his mother or Chandler himself. As far as personal gain, Chandler had $5,000 in Scripps Howard stock and received $175 a month from a trust fund, but was set to inherit much more than that. They didn't believe Betty would murder him to gain less when he was set to get much, much more. Based on the evidence found, they indicated Chandler's murderer likely knew him, but hated him. At first glance, it felt that maybe Chandler's death was the work of some pervert, who only got satisfaction out of a crime so heinous, but that was ruled out. A psychiatrist stated the murder was committed by someone who was mentally ill and was probably hostile towards this particular victim. With a little more insight, attention turned to Chandler's friends and coworkers. Several high school friends were brought in for questioning, but felt no closer to a solution. Many of them voluntarily came to the station to give a lie detector test. His friends provided varying accounts of Chandler's character, but were eventually eliminated as suspects. His coworkers from the lab had nothing out of the ordinary to say. In fact, he was described as an excellent worker who never missed a day of work. He was well liked by everyone. While digging into Chandler, police discovered the day before his murder, a call was received for emergency services. Mid-afternoon, the fire department arrived to find a couch on fire in the living room. No one is sure how the fire started or why. The only lead in the case came from a report of a stolen first aid kit from a Lido Beach lifeguard stand three days before the murder. The kit reportedly contained scissors, four rolls of two-inch tape, rope, and a diving knife. The tape and rope in these kits were found to be identical to the one used by the killer during Chandler's murder. Several people were questioned in relation to the missing kit, but no one knew anything, and like other leads, this one was a dead end. The main clues in the case, the fingerprints, and the mask, were sent to the FBI headquarters for testing in Washington. However, it's unclear what the results from this testing were. Other than interrogating those closest to the situation, investigators spent time studying behavior patterns of deviants and trying to understand why someone would make almost a ceremony out of this crime. They ultimately believed the killer was most likely a youth under 25 years of age, based upon Chandler's age and the typical crowd who hangs out at the beach where the kit was stolen. In total, more than 400 people were interviewed, and despite several suspects, they were unable to charge anyone with Chandler's murder, and it ultimately went cold. Despite the case being open, nothing new came until 1994, when two amateur sleuths decided to take on the unsolved murder. Richard Mize and Clark Woodruff grew up obsessed with the case and believed if the right person talked, they could close it up. They dedicated themselves to the case, making it their full-time job to check every angle. Police were willing and cooperative with the men in their passion project. They hoped digging around and asking questions would help jog memories, but a lot of people were unwilling to be involved, including Chandler's family. His family felt, at that point, solving the case would bring nothing, and if it meant reliving the case, they didn't want to go through it all over again. They felt it's taken too long to cope with the murder, and if it could benefit anyone, they would want it solved. But it just can't. The sleuths understood the family's pain, but thought it would be better if solved. So someone, whether dead or alive, would not get away with murder. They devoted two years to the cause and narrowed it down to potentially five suspects. Three alive, two deceased. Suspects included an unnamed doctor who they felt were capable of making the incisions on Chandler and had access to the medical supplies if they didn't come from the first aid kit. Another were a set of students who were supposedly mad at Chandler for spreading rumors about their sexuality. A couple of weeks before his death, Chandler told Betty these two men tried to run him off the road. 
The next plausible suspect was a man named Stanley Mack, who was considered a suspect in the unsolved Walker family murders in 1959. Stanley worked as a meter reader for Chandler's stepmother's home and also for the Walker family. Prior to the Walker family murders, Stanley enlisted the help of a psychiatrist to help with his thoughts of wanting to kill his wife and two small children. The coincidence seemed too much, but no evidence was found to link Stanley to either murder. The last suspect was James Leland Webb. James was a department store mail clerk, and on August 13, 1960, he was driving around when he saw a parked car with its lights on. Inside was a man named Jewel Levain, a service station attendant. Jewel was asleep in the car when Webb decided to pull over. He claimed he tried to turn off the lights, but couldn't, so he returned to his own car to retrieve plastic strips, which he then placed over Jewel's face. He went back to the car and got a nylon cord, plastic tape, and a plastic bag. Jewel was then tied up with his hands around his waist and the bag placed over his head. It was sealed around his neck with the tape. Then James left the scene. Police were able to pick James up later the same night based on a description from a nearby witness. When asked why, James explained he killed him for no reason at all. They attempted to establish a link between his slaying and Chandler's based on the method of murder, but weren't able to place him in Sarasota at the time. James did stand trial and was eventually committed to a mental hospital for Jules' murder. Although police believe the men were on the right track in a few of their clues, they were under the belief that this case would never be solved. No one was ever questioned by the duo because they wanted crucial evidence against someone in order to turn the investigation back to the police. The two also do not believe family had anything to do with it and also believe the angle of being a hit for hire impossible due to the time spent on the crime. At this point, they know the likelihood of solving Chandler's murder is slim. They won't know who did it unless they confess. And no one wants to talk. After nearly seven decades, the murder of Chandler Steffens continues to haunt the community of Sarasota, Florida. Hi friends, thank you so much for watching. Leave your thoughts below so we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, consider leaving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more from me. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. I just wanted to take a quick moment say happy thanksgiving to everyone this video will be uploaded a few days before so i wanted to let you know how much i appreciate this community and all of the support you've given me the last few years youtube was always a dream but it can be kind of scary to put yourself out there and i'm just happy i found my place here you all truly made me feel validated as a creator and i just can't thank you enough for this platform you all are the best and i hope you have a great holiday but for now we must part ways so stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.